the thumbs up. Welcome back. We got a couple different things uh, going on today. We're going to finish up chapter four. We were in the middle of linear regression. Let's go back to that and then wrap up with seasonal relatives, also known as seasonal indices. And I'm not going to write anything else on the agenda. And you might think, oh, okay, well, that's a, that's a short class, right? Because there's only two topics. Uh, not exactly. You might make a note to yourself in case you're looking for it later. Super multiple choice in that uh, it's not exactly a topic in our discussion of operations management, but I thought that I would spend a little bit of time at the beginning of class to talk a little bit about something that uh, a lot of you have already noticed. Now anyway, what I've just done here, though, is pull up a slide. And um, the slide has a definition on it. And actually that definition is copy-paste from the margin of your textbook. Uh, the slide just has the definition on it. Does anybody, a set of activities dedicated to the transformation of inputs into outputs, if you just had to guess, what do you think that that is actually the definition of? What's the missing language here, the missing keyword? Anyone? You want a hint? So it says click for hint. I can do that. If we click for on the hint, what it should do is yes, gives us three choices at least. Processes, supply chain, or operations. The activities that dedicated to transformation of inputs into outputs. Die. Huh? Operations, yeah, don't, don't be shy. Yes, it's operations. All right, well, this particular little slide deck that I have only has three of these in it. A segment of a larger organization usually managed as a profit and loss center. There is something from your reading, but it's a bump out definition. Here, I'll go ahead and click on the hint, right? Uh, if you had to pick from one of these three, a segment of a larger organization, hello, is that an input, a core competency, or a business unit? Yeah, the business unit. And then the third one, oh, generalized pattern of phases of product demand over time, incubation to decline. What was that? What do we call that? We spent time with that. Click for the hint. Order winners, product lifecycle, or business analytics? Yeah, that's, that's the product lifecycle. Now, why am I showing you these slides? And then a uh, footnote under that, and where did these slides actually come from? Because you can retrieve, for any definition in the book, you can retrieve a slide deck like this if you wanted to. But why would you want to? This is the challenge that is central to super multiple choice. Let's escape out of this. We don't need it anymore. OK, you go. And let's see, not that yet. Here's our UB Learns site, and a lot of you have already uh, browsed this. It says, thinking ahead to our exam on March 8th, uh, top of the document section, all the super, more, super multiple choice materials uh, is uh, out there ready uh, for your consideration. Now let me open this folder, and there's a whole series of things in here. Let me make it a little less busy. There we go, right? The first one is a document that I brought to class. And I know I can tell from uh, UB Lawrence that a lot of people have uh, already read this, but this is actually what I'm waving around as well. Okay, this would be a really good time of the semester to play a little bit with super multiple choice. Why? so that it is totally familiar to you by the night of the exam, which, yeah, even as I'm talking in real time, is still a ways away. It's March 8th. I mean, so we still have two weeks. Although this is, this is fairly typical. 
uh, I will usually, I try to release the super multiple choice page of your exam two weeks before the exam. Because what is it? Well, first off, this is frequently asked questions. What's super multiple choice? In case you're curious, if you ever go into the business of writing exams, like that's what I spend a lot of time doing, super multiple choice actually refers to a set of questions, a set of them, that all use the same choice, the same set of answers, right? You pick from the same set of answers for each of them. There are five super multiple choice uh, questions on your exam. Oh, you knew that? because that was part of what you had to read then for the pre-EQS, because that's mentioned in the syllabus. Yes, but what do they actually look like? Well, you now know exactly what they look like, because this packet, among other things, provides you some practice examples. Let me just advance the page. There are a couple hundred keywords that you've passed in your reading chapters one through five. We already set the scope of the exam. Uh, we could do that. I have selected 60 out of those. It is this exact 60. Your super multiple choice uh, question, the, sh the sheet, it will be behind the regular multiple choice questions, will look exactly like this. It'll look exactly like this, except for the fact that it's probably not going to have exactly these definitions up in the front. Because this is what you do. You get five definitions that are picked at random, and you just need to indicate which one of the keywords. It will be this list exactly numbered exactly this way. So for instance, let's see if I can do this. Commercial transactions between an organization and individual customers now, one of the things that I just blew past was that writing at the front, I gave some advice about how to work a super multiple choice on the night of the exam. First off, if the keyword that's defined by that, commercial transactions between an organization and individual customers, if it springs to mind, mark it. Yeah, you know, if you know it, you know what it is. If it doesn't, it's like, uh, think to yourself, what chapter could that be in? Because it's cut off here on the screen, but the chapters are actually named at the bottom of the sheet, and you'll see that, right? So it says at the bottom of the sheet, chapter one is intro to operations management, chapter two is providing services, chapter five is capacity and waiting. I'm looking at commercial transactions between organization and individual customers. That sounds like one of those, like, lofty strategic overall things i'm thinking that that's it's like not a forecasting thing right this is a chapter one or two thing the chapters that they appear in are provided on the sheet so even if you can't think just what is that what is that what is that right if you can think well if that sounds like a chapter one or two thing you have a much shorter list of things to compare okay so commercial transactions between an organization and its individual customers, I'm thinking that that is B2C transactions, you know, was discussed in chapter two, uh, overall operation strategy. This sheet, what it gives you is a chance to practice because it has the answers marked. Let me forward it. On the next page. So let's see, my guess was six. Yes, six. Six was one of the answers. Oh, right, because this is exactly what your answer sheet will look like on exam night, right? Uh, so as much as you can know about an exam, obviously, in advance and get familiar with it, the less stress you'll have actually during the exam period. So I would take a look at this. Now, I can switch the view here. Just in terms of, you know, what to expect on exam night, obviously, it says print your name. Please do that. Clearly, your student number is actually only a backup to this. This isn't scanned. It's hand graded. And uh, if we can't make out something concerning a person's name, we drop back to the student number to make sure 
we have the right person. But you fill in that information. This grid is for the 27 just normal multiple choice questions. Notice that there are five choices in each case because structurally they look like the EQS questions or the questions that are kind of like I mixed into our notes because those are very, very, very old ones. Okay, you've seen that. Grid two over here, super multiple choice. If I think that that top one is six, then I fill in the six. The next one here, a non-repeating deviate, whoops, a non-repeating deviation in a time series created by a distinct identifiable external source. That thing has a name. Even if I couldn't think of what the term for that is, that's definitely time series. I mean, it's, that's a forecasting. It's going to be something that's in chapter four. And I'm sort of thinking that we were talking about that because we were looking at the effect of EQS modules on our login time series. Right, and that's exogenous variation. Okay, so that's 19. I would bubble in 19, and so on and so on. You would only bubble in five things. One of the things about super multiple choice that definitely works in your advantage as the test taker is do you notice that you don't have to indicate which one's which? We just grade that pattern. That's actually a little bit of flexibility that works uh, to your advantage. What works to our advantage? This is a very good way of eliminating the issue of luck for the assessment of certain types of things, like the acquisition of language, right? Um, that's the appeal of super multiple choice. Uh, either you kind of know it or you don't, but you have everything that you need to score perfect on super multiple choice. We've released everything exactly what the sheet will look like. Now, other resources, because it says this folder that all of this is in is the super multiple choice practice kit. What do I mean by that? Well, here is just a blank one. Okay, open in Word. It's in Word so that you can insert your own definitions or have somebody do that for you to create more examples. You say, well, yeah, but I, I'm not going to type all those definitions. You don't need to. Super multiple choice spreadsheet. There they are. List of 60 words for exam one. This is exactly where we get the definitions when we're generating. Oh, another thing that's nice about super multiple choice is I think you're getting it's very easy to randomize on the test preparation. And yeah, this is where we're retrieving. Uh, those uh, definitions from. What other things are there? Okay, well, actually, if you want to prepare for game day, there's a blank uh, exam uh, answer sheet, just like the one that I showed you. And these are just for fun. Some people like these, others are like, yeah, no, it doesn't help. I, I have this little app that generates crossword puzzles, and these are crossword puzzles that are uh, generated from the definitions. So you might enjoy that resource. Also, the idea of recognizing the language of operations management. Where did I get those three slides that we started with? I got them off of Note Shaper. Note Shaper is mentioned under supplements in the syllabus, noteshaper.com. Uh, log into my account. I, since I'm actually the tutor in a lot of these videos, uh, I was comped an account, and I can never remember the login information for it. And if I want keyword slides, I don't need to, because I go to Browse Note Shaper for free, start browsing Note Shaper. All that rest of the stuff I just went past is explaining about the various services. I need to select the second edition. That is what we're using. Then it's a simple chapter structure, for instance, providing goods and services. Now, these refer to the problems at the back of the chapter, and the extra refer to other problems that are similar if you like wanted to keep practicing something. Let me try launching one of these. This is the part that doesn't work unless you subscribe, and the subscription is $30 for the entire semester, or $10 for 48 hours. We don't need that, though. We don't need that because we go to a chapter and just look under free supplements. That's where I got those slides from. 
Chapter 2, keyword flashcards in alphabetical order. Chapter 2, keyword flashcards in random order. A uh, variety of other things. There's a crossword puzzle, but it wouldn't be the specific 60 words. This stuff is for um, students all over that are using the chapter. Sometimes if there is a problem that involves a lot of data, for instance, the spreadsheet that you see me using in class is actually under here under free supplements. So uh, one other way to prepare for this is you could download those flashcards. Now you're going to have several hundred words over the five chapters. Sure, then go in there and make your own slide deck that's just the keywords. And the, you say, well, why didn't you construct that for us? Well, actually, the act of constructing that is good studying right there. You're already starting to kind of settle those ones into your mind. So that's just a suggestion as well. All right, so we don't need Note Shaper anymore. We will get back to what that thing is right there. The keywords, I think that's everything that is in the practice kit. Again, there are three of these already done. You could generate as many of them as you like, and the answers are marked on the next page, just as you would mark them on exam night. If you want a blank one for yourself, just look in that practice kit. There are blank answer sheets. So I know a lot of people are like, yawn, I've already looked at that. Yeah, good for you, because it's actually been out now for about a week. Does anybody in here have any questions on that? Okay, well, there'll be, there'll be a super multiple choice sheet on each of the three exams. Now you know exactly what the one on your upcoming exam on March 8th could look like. You have everything that you need to piece together, any number of ones to practice on. Okay, then we, why don't we, let's, let's do a little bit of material, and then there's something else that was just posted uh, on UB Learns that I think that you might be interested in, but we'll save that for the end of class. So I marked where we were. It seems like, right, we were talking about linear regression. We'd started talking about linear regression. Let me zoom out just a little bit here. And we'd noted that, oh yeah, that's right. That is so stats class. You have seen this before probably multiple times. This is a tool from stats class in the context of this is typically how we use it in operations. Oh, so that's a nice little bit of savings and studying. At least for the first exam, we tend to encounter the most number of topics. So yeah, you've seen that before. Maybe not just like this specific application. Now, what we wanted to do was actually extract some insight that we might actually be able to use in the future to forecast the independent variable. We were practicing the vocabulary based on the size of the contract, which is to say we need to fill out these two formulas to determine what the slope and the intercept is of that embedded line. I think the absolute last thing that we noted was, right, I actually got this problem from the book. That's the problem that generates the um, uh, graph that we were looking at on the page before. So to proceed, we need all of these various pieces and parts. You have to find the slope first, like that. Oh, and we've seen that before. In the case of Livingston Medical Services or whatever it is, what is the N? N is always the sample size. So they're saying they have this old data on a bunch of contracts. How many contracts? Seven. Now for the linear regression formula, we also need X bar, or that is to say just the average X. I did that. For average X, I get 10,634. What's that supposed to mean? It means over these past seven contracts, on average, about 10,000 clients were covered by each contract. It's just the average of this column. Then Y bar the average Y. Okay, the average number of 
uh, requests for transport under that contract. Average those numbers together, you get a smaller number, 1,080. Um, now, what else do we need to roll up here? Got that, got that. Oh, don't have that right there. That's the sum of x times y. We saw that also in the correlation coefficient. Um, okay, that's each one of these things multiply by each other and then add them up. Uh, so I get a very large number, 1, 2, 2, 1, 9, 8, 0, 4, 1. And then we also need, something's missing, oh, the sum of x squared right there. That would be where I would square each one of these numbers, and then I would add them up. Very large number, 1. Then another one, 9, 4, 9, 8, 0, 6, 4, 1. Okay, that was a means to an end, right? Let me move to the board. There's a nice fresh piece of chalk. You've got room here. I'm just going to go where I have a little bit more elbow room. Because let's figure this out. For this problem, just piece it together. Okay, B equals the sum of x times y. Oh boy, that's this number right here. Minus, we said 7 was n times the two averages, 10,600 and 34 times 1,080. I'll put more starry kind of multiplication signs so we don't confuse them with x, the independent variable. That's all in the numerator. Uh, Dave, you don't have the program up. Can everybody see this? Okay, good, thank you. Then uh, in the denominator, okay, the even bigger number, 11949806411 minus 7, again, n times, uh, oh, times the average x, 6, 3, 4 squared. Right, I'm just piecing that formula together that we were looking at. So I get by the time, and check me on this, you do that, store it in the memory, you do this, right? Recall the memory divided by that, um, 0 0.104. After all that work, after all those numbers and all that work, B equals 0 0.104. What is that even supposed to mean? Well, let's hang on to that thought, at least just finish the formulas. Remember how you have to find B and then you find A, the intercept? Okay, so take the average Y, Y bar, and subtract out, right, we needed that 0 0.014 because we needed to multiply it times the average X. There's the scratch work. And then A comes out to be about negative 22 what I get. Um, all right. That's an awful lot of scratch work. For what? Well, now that we're done, we remember we're trying to create, through linear regression, a tool for predicting how many requests there will be from clients from a contract based on the size of the contract. And this, we're actually looking at it, it's just not arranged in a very intuitive fashion, that's all. Because the tool itself looks like this. Y, right, requests equals negative 22, right, plus 0.104 times x, which is the size of the contract. So if I wanted to estimate 
for a potential contract, how much work is this actually going to be? How many uh, requests for van service will it generate? I say, all right, well, how many clients are covered by this contract? I put that number in. I do this arithmetic. Da-da, that's how you use it. Um, let's first just look at this formula because I have a question. Let's suppose, and this is fiction, but let's suppose that we're considering writing a contract that doesn't cover any clients. There's like zero people living in that subdivision. Okay, so all right, that means x equals zero. Yeah, I'm just saying suppose, it'd be bizarre, but yeah. The theory is, according to this scientifically derived formula, if you wrote a contract for an area that didn't have any clients in it, exactly how many requests would you get for van service? Zero? One would expect zero intuitively, but remember the arithmetic, you put a zero in here, and the formula informs you that how many requests for van service will there be? Negative 22. What's a negative 22 number of requests look like? Well, it's nonsense. It's not rational. Oh, all right. Right away, we're bumping up against, and we just, these are, <laughs> we did it out longhand just to review the algebra, but there are about a thousand different ways to calculate a linear regression. It's a very, very common tool in business analysis. It's not just operations. Nothing wrong with it, but we have to realize its limitations. Yeah, the actual formal estimate would be a negative 22. You just get the intercept back, right, if you put a zero in here. Um, we're running up against the problem of relevant range. First off, if you do this type of analysis, moving forward, here's the rule of thumb. Practically speaking, future numbers that you put in here they should be within the range of the x's in the data. Everybody see that? Because in the data, look, there was one very small contract. What's that, 149? And there was, what's the largest contract? 2,500 some odd? Oh, uh, 2,560? This is the most trustworthy if you're testing future contracts that are in within that range. See how the zero is outside of that range? We don't have any past data on, because that would be really bizarre, but we don't have any past data on uh, clients and communities that don't have anybody in them. Oh, all right. So maybe more reasonably, just for an example, I should pick a uh, number that's inside the, the relevant range, so to speak. Let's see. I have some handwriting to myself in these notes. What would this formula predict for a uh, contract that covers 2,100 clients. See, suppose somebody's on the phone, clients. That's the size of the contract. Somebody's on the phone and they're asking us to bid. And they say this will cover 2,100 clients. Oh, which means in that case, that's the independent variable we think is going to drive basically the activity and our costs. Right. That would be inside that range. So negative 22 plus 0.104 times the 2100. Our guesstimate is what did I get? About 195 transports or requests. Right? I just filled out the formula. I put the number in there. And it's recommending that. And you say, oh, okay. And then this is the idea, is that, okay, I would plan around that. Um, all right, yeah. And that's how you use that. Now, is that a good estimate or bad estimate? Is this advisable to use in the future or not? I mean, certainly simple. Once, <laughs> once you get past calculating the intercept and the slope, 
uh, it's certainly very convenient to use. Put the size of the contract in here. There's the number of transports. We never made any comment on how well this actually fit the data, right? We could do this. We could fill out that formula for any two arbitrary sets of numbers. They just have to be the same length. We could fill out that formula for, for instance, ice cream consumption and violent crime. And we would get back answers about how to predict violent crime from ice cream consumption. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a very good way to do that or how to predict ice cream consumption from violent crime if we thought it ran the other way. But it doesn't mean that that's necessarily a very good way to do that. Although, before we talk about how we might test that, there are analysts that do all this work not because they want specific predictions like the 195. They do all this work because they only want to know the slope. What? Yeah, they're generally analysts, not forecasters, but analysts. Because the slope all by itself, so it sort of has meaning. It communicates something that you can articulate sometimes as useful. Anybody remember, and this is kind of going back to stats class, it's not an operations thing. This um, 0.104, one, about like one tenth. Anybody have a sense of like what that value is? what it's saying about an individual that's covered under a contract concerning their desire to uh, request a van, which is what the contract's for. Yeah, each person covered under the contract, it's suggesting like an average. There's no such thing as a tenth of a request, you know, point one, but it's suggesting that's what it's kind of averaging out to or, or, and I'm just articulating you know, it looks like roughly one in ten people, right, are uh, requesting a van. My father is a sociologist, and the shoemaker's kids go barefoot. I actually don't know a whole lot about sociology, but I do know that they do this a lot. They're only interested in this parameter right here because they're interested in the nature of a relationship. They're not really interested in specifically predicting what communities of humans are exactly going to do next. No, that's more of an operational thing. But what is the relationship between two things? So, now, speaking of that, this particular no page that's visible on the screen Oh, yeah, there are some keyword slides. That's also where I got the thumbnails from. It's from those slide decks on NoteShaper. It says correlation coefficient, and we've already been there. A coefficient of determination. Oh, correlation coefficient. Yeah, that gigantic, awful um, formula that we filled out before for QFD analysis, I did that as well for this problem, and I got a correlation coefficient between these two things, uh, where did I write it down? Oh, 0 0.87. The coefficient of determination you probably know as R squared from stats class because it is the correlation coefficient squared. Uh, when you square that number, I get 0 0.75. And actually, I didn't fill out the formula like we did for QFD analysis. If you want to verify any of the scratch work that I gave you, this is Livingston Medical Services. You can download the spreadsheet. That's the graph that we were looking at. That's the data. Here are the summary statistics. Yeah, I, I, I verified them in Excel. There is the um, slope. There's the intercept, and there's the two numbers that I just quoted you. Generally, for our purposes, trying to anticipate something in the future in operations. While, and you already know this from stats, but we won't get into the detail of it in this class, you know, it does depend on the size of your data set, uh, how impressed you are with a particular value here. We generally like to see very strong correlation coefficients. Right? We're looking for like 0.8s and 0.9s. And the reason is, is because we are trying to predict something that fairly specific. Whereas, you know, in the uh, social sciences, two populations of humans, some factor, 
Uh, my dad's impressed by like a correlation coefficient of 0.2 because he's talking about thousands and thousands of people on each side, and it's for a different purpose. It's simply to confirm if there's a relationship between the two things. So I'm pretty pleased with, and actually you saw that in the scatter plot, the straight line does fit fairly well. Yeah, even in just looking at the data. Obviously, it looks like the more clients there are covered on the contract, I mean, the more requests you get for service, yes. This would be uh, probably a pretty good tool in the future, as long as we didn't go too crazy getting outside that relevant range. But what exactly, if you have to articulate it, explain it to somebody else, does this mean? Now, the correlation coefficient, that's the same thing as from Chapter 3. 0 0.87 is a powerful positive correlation that's intuitive. The more people covered by the contract, the more requests the contract is going to generate. This thing called the R squared, the coefficient of determination, that's pretty handsome as well. But what exactly is that? First off, lingo, the coefficient of determination. That's what it's called, although we tend to call it R squared. Does anybody remember what 0.75, the, what the theory is about the 0.75? Okay, that 0.75 of which you can calculate by squaring the correlation coefficient or you can actually, there's a formula in Excel to um, calculate R squared directly. Here's the theory. You know how we had those seven contracts? You know, they're on the page, printed. Uh, and there's a bunch of different numbers for each of them in the two columns. 75% of the variation in that past data, just the seven contracts, 75% of the variation in the past data is explained by the size of the contract. Everybody hear that? That's the interpretation of R squared. 75, 0.75, 75% of all of the variation that you see in the actual data is explained by your hypothesis you know what, the requests depend on the size of the contract. Now that does mean that 25% of what you're actually looking at in the past data isn't explained by that. But we say, well, you know what, for a ballpark estimate, that's pretty good, right? We'll go forward with that. One last caveat. Notice 75% of the past data it's only speaking of the past data. So we could take this formula tomorrow. Somebody could ask us about a particular contract. We could use the formula, do the arithmetic. There's our estimate of the number of requests. Take that contract, win it. Turns out the number of requests, the estimate, it was way off what actually happened. Hey, because that's all in the future. And who knows? People may get a lot needier in terms of van service. It, it's only speaking of the past. It's only speaking of the data it was built from. And so yeah, OK. Uh, still not a reason, if it's strong, uh, not to consider it. Um, oh, one other footnote, one other caveat. Let's say it wasn't so handsome. Let's say they were both like pretty close to zero, right? And we already talked about that with the correlation coefficient when we were doing the QFD analysis. That, oh man, comes up close to zero, no relationship. Looks like there's no relationship. These two things probably don't have anything to do with each other. Or certainly the size of the contract, I'm saying if these had turned out to be close to zero, uh, isn't going to be very helpful in anticipating the number of uh, requests from the contract. Careful. If this came out close to zero, what it's saying is there's no strong linear relationship. It's called linear regression. Too bad we didn't look at our data because I'm just going to draw a little cartoon here. The original scatter plot, you know, it had seven contracts on it, right? And let's say we never looked at it. Let's say we did these formulas that I'm stressing today in class, and the correlation coefficient and the R squared are totally unimpressive, and we never looked at the graph, because let's say, well, okay, that's four, five, six, seven. Let's say that that's actually what the scatter plot looked like on the first page. Um, 
are you prepared to say that there's no relationship between this and that? I, I'm trying to draw an exaggerated but very powerful relationship. They're, they're creating something predictably, right? Yeah, it's a curvilinear relationship, which occur all the time in lots of different situations where, you know, when x is small, it tends to be certain values, and when x is in a mid-range, the, the response tends to be this, and it's diminishing returns. Like when x becomes large, a lot of times in marketing, diminishing returns like ad saturation, it turns around and starts going back down again. All right, if you hadn't looked at the graph, you would have missed that completely because you're trying to fit a straight line. And the r squared is only telling you about the straight line. No, this definitely does not fit that. That doesn't mean that this can't be used to predict this, right, if we just looked at it. Any questions about that? All right, linear regression you've seen before. Seasonal relatives, maybe you haven't. We should revisit something. We don't need this anymore on the computer. Uh, we need, remember this? This is the number of logins on UB Learns. I updated it. Does anybody remember my forecast? Remember? Right? I said, I said I thought that the, it had ended right there, and I said I thought, I think it's going to have kind of a flat top. Um, okay, it's a little bit more of a chisel than what, you know, my prediction, but still pretty close. You see that sort of mesa-like top and then the drop. That was yesterday. And I, and I could say that because I've seen that pattern many times before because we said, all oh, right, exogenous variation. That kind of mesa top, right, high and a little bit flat at the top, that's Monday and Tuesday of an EQS module. That tends to be how it presents itself. You can see it actually here. It was cut off, right, spring 2013. You can see it's more of a needle point there, but that's the same thing going on spring 2013. That is the same thing that's going on in spring 2016 right in there. Okay. Oh, and linear regression can be used for trend analysis, because now we're back to time series. The thing that we did with Livingston Medical Service is classic associative modeling. We were trying to figure out a way to predict something based on some other factor. In this case, it was the size of the contract. If you think that you can predict something linearly, and your factor is only the passage of time, that is actually the trend component going all the way back to um, uh, when we were talking about time series decomposition. I think there is a tab for that. Oh yeah, linear regression. This is a full semester, so it's the spring 2016 one that I had selected for comparison. And there is a linear regression of it. The R square is only 0 0.06. Uh, it is suggesting that there is, in general, an upward growth in logins throughout the semester. But I, I, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed by the, um, oh, goodness of fit. That's what these are known as measures of the goodness of fit. How well does this actually fit the complexity of this? Well, really, it doesn't fit it at all. Right, other forces explain it. I had said that at the beginning, right, that with our, our login, I don't think there's a strong trend component generally. It's fairly stable. And here you can see, at least with spring 2016, um, yeah, not, not very impressive. Not very impressive because other than exogenous influences, EQS modules in particular, and spring break, the big hollow spot right in there, the other powerful driver of the login pattern, oh, we noticed that is a seasonal influence. There is a consistent days of the week kind of pattern. That's what's creating your impression of teeth if you look across, right, up, down, up, down, up, down. All right, now, you've had linear regression before, but you may not have seasonal relatives. What are seasonal relatives? Just like linear regression extracts a straight line out of data, 
seasonal relatives attempt to extract an expression of the consistent up, down, up, down, up, down that you see so that you can use it to forecast in the future. Now, the, I find that the best way to talk about how one extracts a season out of a pattern that is experiencing seasonality is to simply, it's the type of thing, it's simply easiest to simply walk through because they're not hard to calculate. This is my favorite recipe. There's actually several, but they're all variations on a theme. If you want to extract an expression of a repeating pattern that you sense in data, there's a series of steps. Now, this is no page 28, right? It has, and I totally made this up, data for parking tickets here on the north campus of the University of Buffalo. We have three semesters, right? And there's four years. So this is right away, if anybody bothered to gather this data, we're suggesting that we think that the number of parking tickets that are written varies reliably with the semester, which would be a cycle of three seasons here, correct? Remember, seasonality doesn't necessarily refer to four seasons of the year. It can refer to days of the week. The question is, is just for your application, what you're trying to study and what you're trying to predict in the future, what is it? Okay, well, I think I do see a very clear pattern of fluctuation, right? There are a lot fewer tickets written in the summertime, and that makes sense because here on the North Campus, there are a lot fewer classes in the summertime, so there's simply a lot fewer users of the parking infrastructure. It does look like consistently fall would be a peak period. This would be another reason why you're studying this, right? Is if you sense that your operation su suffers consistent peak periods and then quiet periods so that you can predict that in the future. Um, all right, well, then let's go ahead and see if we can extract that pattern. What do you do? It says obtain a sample of time series data. Well, we already did that. We were looking at that, right? and calculate the average value for each season. So just for brevity's sake, there's only four years of past data here, n equals four. Certainly, if we could get more, we would want more uh, in reality. Now let me think, the average, I can just make another row, right? Because the average for each season, what I'm doing is I'm just averaging the columns. So in spring, 100, 120, 110, and 100, I get an average of 107.5. In summer, average these together, 37.5. In fall, 150, 170, 160, 170, average the four of those together, and I get 162.5. Okay, that part's done. Now, average the season's averages, the grand average. Each one of these, you know, we would say is an X bar. The step number two is asking for, essentially here, I'll write it over here, X double bar. What is the average of these averages? Okay, well, I did that, and X double bar, the grand overall average, the average of the averages, I get 102.5. And usually if you're doing these computations, this is, this is how you do it. You average these together. This 102.5, though, you can check me on this. It is actually also the average of if you, like in Excel, just grabbed all of this and said average. So what does it mean? It means on average, 102 and a half parking tickets are written each semester, at least across these four years of past data. Now these things called seasonal relatives, that's done. This is the step that creates them. Divide each season's average by the average of the averages. The result is the index value for that season. So I have a little bit of room to work down here. Let me first create the index value or the relative for spring. I say the season's average divided by the grand average. And I get, doing a little rounding, 1.05. Now, what's that mean? Well, let's do all three and come back to that question. But I want to hang on to that. That one's spring. 
that one's spring. What about summer? Well, summer's average is 37.5 divided by the same old grand average of 102.5. Summer's average, then the index is 0 0.37 when you do the arithmetic there. And then for fall, it's that 162. 162 divided by 102.5. For fall, I get 1.59. So spring, summer, fall. This is what a set of seasonal relatives looks like. Yes, seasonal relatives. So set of numerical values, this one, this one that one, and that one that describe a seasonal pattern. Now, what is this supposed to mean? Like if somebody handed you, they said, we use these seasonal relatives in our analysis, and you're looking at it's the set of numbers. First off, they have an interpretation of their own. You can read them if you know what they're signaling. Any season that has a particularly small number, it's distinctly below 1. The key value is 1. For instance, summer, that is a quiet season. That is a down season, right? That is a lull, a consistent lull in the data. Any season that the seasonal relative is distinctly above 1, aggressively above 1, that's a peak. Your largest seed, and however many there are in the set, your largest one is your peak, peak season. So, right, that confirms that, in fact, it looks like the peak season for parking tickets is in the fall. Why? Because it's 1.59. In the spring, 1.05, that's kind of like neither peak nor lull. Any, any, any season whose seasonal relative is close to one, whatever happens in that season is pretty close to the overall average. Okay, so it tends to be sort of a middle ground. And... Before we move off of that, why don't we look at the same thing, but just in the context of, yes, the UB Learns data. Because on the tab seasonality, what I did was I actually grabbed a whole bunch of past data. I needed to know, so I imported in what the day of the week was. And these numbers right here, right, are the result of that same recipe. Averaging all the Wednesdays together, averaging all the Thursdays together, averaging all the, for all, across all of these years. So you see that our seasons are the days of the week. And of the days of the week, what is our quietest day of the week? What's our low? Saturday. It's actually Saturday. Sunday picks up a bit. See that? Saturday tends to be our quietest day in terms of logins. And then our peak is, you're looking for the largest value? Tuesday. We do tend to consistently peak in terms of the number of logins on Tuesdays. Um, part of that, I think, is the Monday-Tuesday window of EQS modules. But actually, if you look at non-EQS weeks as well, it does tend to uh, peak around Tuesday. Um, and yeah, and then the other ones are spread uh, in between. So, oh, as long as we're still just talking about like having a set of seasonal relatives and like, you know, what's this supposed to mean? What can I gauge from this? Oh, well, Saturday's pretty quiet and Sunday is the second most quiet. That makes sense. Oh, the um, Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are fairly quiet. Another thing about seasonal relatives is that they're a set of numbers, right? If you've done the arithmetic correctly, they should add up to the number of seasons. Everybody hear that? Seasonal relatives, so it's a set of numbers, and if you've done the arithmetic correctly to create them, they should add back up to the number of seasons. I mean, it may be off a little bit because of just rounding and expressing the individual uh, numbers, but this will, for instance, add up to seven because there's seven seasons here. The other one for the parking tickets, look at it. It adds back up to about three because there were three seasons there. 
Oh, so it's expressing the seasonality in the cycle by taking the number of periods that the so takes it to cycle completely and redistributing the value across the busy versus the quiet. That's essentially numerically what it's doing. So, yeah, okay. Well, other than telling me when the quiet period was, which I think I could kind of just tell by looking at the averages, right? What, what, what good is this? All right. You have a set of seasonal relatives. There are two things you can do with it. There are two different uses. And it's important just to, they're both really simple, but it's important to keep them distinct. They're actually alluded to on the next page in the notepad. What are these numbers used for? The first thing is forecasting. Only that's not actually what was pre-printed in the NOPEC, right? It says to seasonalize data. This is a task when you're forecasting. Now, uh, the, the instructions are already pre-printed there. It says multiply by the appropriate seasonal index. Why would you do this? Because this is very common in actual forecasting. A lot of times we get an overall larger forecast, like an annual forecast, because that's easier to forecast first. You know, just for the year, how many parking tickets do you think that there will be? You get a number back. And then we have to break that large forecast down over the seasons. So to attach some numbers to it, yeah, let's create a scenario. Suppose someone, maybe it's UPD, has forecast. Now notice this has already happened. 360 parking tickets will be written this year, 2019. All right, we've only seen a little bit of 2019, but this is their best guess of by the time that it's over, in total, how many parking tickets will be written? All right. How many this summer? Let's suppose somebody wanted to know that. How many this summer? OK, well, first off, we have this overall vision of 360. Take the 360. It's intuitive. We could divide it by three, right, because there's three semesters a year. So I get a number, 120. 120 parking tickets. This is known as a deseasonalized number. What? Because if you if you say, well, you know, the annual forecast of 360 is implying that there'll be 120 uh, tickets written each semester. We already know it doesn't work that way. A whole lot more of them are written in the fall than the spring. It's not that this is irrelevant, but it does not reflect the seasons. By dividing by three, right, I'm taking the vision and I'm just splitting it equally. How do you sprinkle in the season, right? How do you season it? You multiply it. Multiply it by the appropriate index number. So for summer, our index number was um, 0 0.37. You know, check me on that. Say 120 times 0 0.37, I get like 43.9, of which there's no such thing in terms of parking tickets. So I'm pretty comfortable at calling that at 44. So I would say, you know, based on your annual forecast of 360 for the year, in the summer, probably about 44 will be written. If they wanted to know how many in the fall, because that's the really busy time. Well, we'd actually start with the same 120, and we just multiply it by the falls index number, which is 1.59. And do you see how it boosts it? I'd say about 190, based on the annual forecast. Now, that's seasonalizing. Any questions on that? Because our, our chapter and our topic is forecasting, and, and you do that when you're forecasting. You're breaking down larger forecasts. There is another very common use for the exact same tool. It's the opposite to deseasonalized data. You're generally not forecasting, at least not directly. 
you're generally an analyst and you are analyzing past data. And you say, um, okay, I need to create another scenario. The scenario would have to be about the past in order for it to be an example of this. So, suppose in spring, uh, let's go way back, 2008, 100 tickets were written. You know, because we, we have this data, were written. Then, looking at the old records in summer of 2008, 80 tickets were written. Now, what's the context? I have two numbers, right, the 180. For some reason, I'm reflecting all the way back on uh, the year 2008. But maybe that caught my eye. Because actually, if I have been perusing parking ticket data, uh, you know, you're looking at that and you go, well, yeah, duh. There's the spring, and then in the summer it was less. You know, isn't that the pattern? Yeah. It sure doesn't look like as dramatic a drop, though. I'm just looking at it compared to if you look at the table the past four years, it just doesn't. Of course, I'm just looking at it, and I'm just kind of speculating. There's a way of confirming this. Here's the problem, in essence. I'm comparing two different seasons. And yes, it's true. In the summertime, they write less tickets. But in this particular scenario that I'm analyzing, it doesn't seem like it's a lot less, but it's tough to tell what part of it is the summer Right? That was going to happen anyway. And what part of it is maybe something's catching my eye. Something unusual was happening in that particular scenario all the way back in 2008. Well, if you want to compare two unlike seasons, right, you can take, here's the theory, you can take the influence of the season out. That's what analysts do. How do you do that? It's just the opposite of what we just did. You divide. You divide by the appropriate index number. So... If we were investigating what was going on in 2008, we'd say, okay, well, in the spring, there was 100. That's the actual. I'm going to divide it by the index number. And I get this other number, 95.2. And I'm going to write this out because it's pretty abstract. These are de-season, season alized deseasonalized tickets. It's not even a word that uh, Microsoft spell check necessarily recognizes. You say, well, what is this supposed to mean, 95.2? It doesn't mean a whole lot by itself. It actually, by itself, doesn't, it's very difficult to attach any use to it. The point is, is comparing it to summer. Because in summer, there was the 80 tickets written, and you divide by the index number, and I get, oh, man, it blows up, 216.2. That confirms something that caught my eye. The theory is, if the difference between two numbers, it doesn't have to be parking tickets in 20, uh, 2008, if the difference between two numbers is solely due to the season, it's the season. Summers, it's always less. Okay? When you deseasonalize the two numbers, you should get very similar numbers. Everybody hear that? The deseasonalized number should, because you took the season out and that was the only reason. Yeah, the generally is less in summertime. Do you notice in this particular case, not only did they become uh, similar, they went in the opposite directions. The, the difference between them is now exaggerated. Now, whether that means that they wrote an unusually low number of tickets in the spring or an unusually high number of high tickets in the summer, we'd have to keep investigating this particular technique. It doesn't tell us any more than that. But what it does tell us is there is some influence other than the season. And you see this used all the time, especially if you're like, 
into finance and economics. Let's see if this tab is still open. Yes. This is it. As a, a, as a consumer of economy class airline seats, I always get a kick out of this particular website. This link is in the same directory that all the slides and all the lecture spreadsheets are. And what this is, it starts all the way back in 2000 and they continuously update it. This is, oh, and this is going to be our next um, subject. This is the capacity of U.S. airlines in terms of, and their actual measure is seat miles. So it's the number of seats times the number of miles on the leg that they're flying. And you can see it looks kind of like an EKG, right? You see, right, this is another example of a time series that uh, has a very strong seasonal component because the airlines routinely fly more flights certain times of the year, so there would be more seat miles, right? And fly less uh, during other times of the year. And they do this, why? Just to be mean? If you had to guess, you don't really need to know anything about airlines. I mean, why do lots of people go buy airline tickets? Where do they travel? Vacation. Yeah, vacation. There are vacation seasons, right? Yes. Oh, now, the in blue, the thing that looks like an EKG, that's the actual number of seat miles. And they routinely, this is pre-posted. This is the deseasonalized seat miles, right? These are the, de the blue is the deseasonalized numbers because they've done the same thing, right? They took the past data, they have an index for January, February, March, April, May, and they took the actual data point and they divided it by that and then they plotted it over that. This is another use of that, you know, why would you do that? Because it takes the noise, or at least some of the noise, out of the original data, and as an analyst, right, you're looking back, you're reflecting, it may clarify some other things. For instance, it's interesting, you can see how capacity, carrying capacity in the air, U.S. airlines anyway, tanks right around here, you know, the Great Recession, yeah, they take a lot of uh, flights off of line, part of their fleets off of line, and then it kind of looks like it plateaus for a few years, but it seems to be on a steady rise now. He said, yeah, well, I can see that even looking at the scribbly EKG. Okay, that's good, right? But sometimes the more complicated a pattern is, the harder it is to just look at the pattern itself. You take out the uh, scribbly part, the seasonal fluctuation might clarify uh, what you're thinking. Yep, definitely. It's been trending upwards lately over the last couple of years. Now, any questions on that? Okay, now... We've been talking about all different ways of forecasting something. And right, here in real time, you have already gotten an email on this. Let's take a look at something on UB Learns. This is the Super Multiple Choice Practice Kit. That's where we started today. Let's go to announcements. Thinking ahead to March 8th, that is Super Multiple Choice. I posted time series forecasting contest. Let's do this. You have this time series that, whoops. You have this time series that you can download here, right? This is uh, the data from our class and from two other past classes. There's also another spreadsheet that you can download, although you can get this information from so many different places, right? This is just where I happen to have downloaded. It's the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And since you've got to start practicing this thinking about what you use to forecast, I thought, well, why don't we have a contest? Because right now, for instance, in the case of the UB Learns login data, right now it is, the data is posted up through to yesterday. So that is February 20th. The contest is who comes the closest to guessing how many people log in on March 6th? Did everybody hear that? So it's a certain day. I'm just pulling a certain day out of the future, March 6th. Now, I'm going to stop updating that spreadsheet because you've seen over the last couple classes I kept updating it. I got the data but I'm going to stop updating it. So you, the reason is, is so that you have to reach out into the future and forecast something. 
Uh, but we'll have a second uh, contest, and that's the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You might be looking at that and saying, you know, I'm not even in the United States. Well, okay, it's, it's a, it's a well-known time series. You don't even have to know about finance. Take a look at that time series and see if you can be the one that comes the closest to guessing what value manifests itself on. Now, notice that the dates are different. March 14th. Why did you have two different dates for the two different contests? Because I'm going to stop updating the UB Learns login data. You're looking ahead. That's You only have through February 20th. I'm trying to create an equivalent challenge in each case, right? You don't have any insight into that data, but you can check for yourself every day and uh, continue to update that time that spreadsheet that I showed you, right? So at a certain point, since both of them, the forecast has to be in by March 5th, it's you're looking ahead the same amount. It's true that if you um, enter your forecast on March 5th, we'll find out the next day if you're the winner of the logging contest. You still had to make your forecast based on the same distance back in time because I stopped supplying the data. You can follow the Dow Jones Industrial Average all the way up until March 5th, but your forecast is for March 14th. That make any sense? Do you see that? Okay, so then only one, if you're interested in playing, and why not? It's costless. It's for bonus points here. That's described here. If you're interested, say, fine, well, how am I supposed to enter the contest? What I did was I repurposed the functionality of, let's look at this, and why don't we look at it from your perspective. It, this is this is in if you have like a, an instructor account in UB Learns, this little thing right here I created with what they call the survey function. Uh, but at, at any rate, this icon right now is hanging here in the EQS uh, area, and it will hang here all the way through March fifth. You have all the way through March fifth. You just click on it, and I apologize. It's not very aesthetic. But at least it's simple because you click on it, say begin, the instructions, right? Please enter your UBIT name here. Please do that because you could win the contest. And since this is a survey function, it doesn't otherwise tell us who made the entry. So if you don't claim it in question one, we don't know who to give the prize to. Oh, and I, we only need your UBIT name. Uh, I'm sorry, there's this huge window with all these formatting functions. You don't need all of that. I couldn't figure out how to get it to, like, not volunteer that. Then, the, then the, the contest is essentially two questions on the survey. Please enter your forecast for the total number of people who will visit UV Learns uh, in the 24 hours of uh, March 6th. That's mine. And please enter your forecast for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We'll, we'll close that on March 14th. Uh, there's my estimate, save and submit, okay, and I'll say thank you, and, and you're in. You're in, you're ready to play. Um, what that's doing is it's accumulating that information from everybody in the spreadsheet so that we can figure out who won. There will ultimately be three contests for, uh, and this is the smallest in terms of bonus point prizes in this class. This forecasting contest, Native Sun and Fine Wine Rack. Oh, one fast footnote. I don't know, you probably don't even remember this, but I had mentioned on the first day of class that in Native Sun we might be playing the uh, U.S. Air Force Academy. And it's on. They're in. There are 300 project management students at the Air Force Academy, and they're going to be working with, this is your first project, Native Sun, as well. So this is after the first exam. That is that competition is on those. So we may add some more prizes uh, just to inspire people. Okay, that wraps up chapter four. I'll see you guys next week.